for the topic this month, I thought we'd talk about something that none of us know much about. But I was saying, saying a minute ago, the solution for the general surgeon and trauma surgeon for rectal trauma is do it fast. And that's not always true. So to update us on what we're going to, what can be done and how to approach these things, Dr. Grimes. Can hear me okay? Too loud? Not loud enough? The, uh, all right, so the topic today is, uh, is rectal trauma. And for some reason, we always have to give disclosures nowadays, though politicians can take all the money they want, but they don't have to disclose it. But I, I don't have any disclosures, uh, the, uh, except for two. One, there, there are a lot of choices of what to do for rectal trauma, and I didn't poll the uh, trauma surgeons to see what they, they actually do. Uh, so I may step on toes, uh, make some I'm not happy. And the other one is, is lunch will probably be the more enjoyable part of the whole talk. So uh, when uh, Dr. Weigel asked me to, to do this, uh, <laughs> As a practicing colorectal surgeon, the trauma folks do most of the trauma. Uh, but I was happy to do it, and I got to go back and, and read a lot of articles and do a lot of reviews. And to me, the whole history and topic was pretty fascinating. And there are just all sorts of uh, names going down through. There's an all-star list of people in the uh, uh, mostly 70s and 80s, and, uh, the trauma literature. But interestingly, Dr. DeBakey, which most of y'all know with regards to heart surgery, uh, was very influential in uh, colon and rectal trauma. Uh, for the, the students who probably don't even know who Dr. DeBakey is anymore, since he was the most famous surgeon probably in the whole world as a heart surgeon, uh, actually started in Louisiana, and he got much of his big start uh, with liver abscesses out of Big Charity Hospital in New Orleans. But Dr. DeBakey had quite a career before he ever started doing the, the heart surgery. But you go down through the list, and these don't mean anything to you, but it sure brought back a lot of memories to me as to when I was a resident and reading articles of, in trauma uh, with Harlan Stone and Dr. Fabian and Feliciano, who uh, examined me on my orals, uh, Dr. Maddox, Jesse Thompson, Flint, Polk, and then uh, uh, Carter Nance, and I presume his son, it was Nance and Nance, and uh, they worked through. Now, Dr. DeBakey wrote after World War II in 1947 and talked a lot about standardization of uh, care, uh, which kind of fits with the heart surgeons anyway. And he had a real interesting perspective in that you have to remember during World War II, the surgeons, the American Board of Surgery wasn't even founded until the 30s. And so we didn't have this nice formal training and people doing trauma fellowships and all and headed off to war. We had a lot of people that had done internships and they were appointed the surgeon in the tent or the area where they were and they did the, the surgery. So there was no telling what was happening. And they came to realize that having some standardization was probably going to help in the long run. So he, he pressed the standardization and pointed out the uh, diversity of folks that were doing it. And one of the main stays of the uh, standardization, as Dr. Weigel pointed out, was the colostomy. And I'll address that a little bit more. But you go all the way, eh, wrong button. I'm not smart enough for this. The, uh, you go all the way down through this list. And I, when I made this list, I just kind of, was flipping through the, the articles I was reading and looking, kind of put them down. I didn't intend for them to go in any particular order. But down here at the bottom with Dr. Nance, uh, he and his son wrote an editorial in response to an article that said for colon surgery, uh, for colon uh, trauma, that a colostomy wasn't necessary. And the title of it was, A Stake Through the Heart of Colostomy. And that was their editorial which I thought was kind of interesting. I, I went back and read the editorial, 
and they didn't make any reference, but I didn't know if that was a pointed comment back to Dr. DeBakey and as a heart surgeon when he made that statement because Dr. DeBakey had proposed the colostomies universally. So uh, to me, it's just kind of interesting to go back and look at this stuff. So everything you need to know for rectal trauma is three Ds, diversion, drainage, presacral drainage, distal washout, and the fourth D, direct repair. And we could be through with the whole topic. I could leave it at that slide, and we'd all be OK. Everybody would be good, but I wouldn't earn this giant honorarium that I'd been promised to, to give this talk. So I'm going to have to come up with some other things to say. So how do people get rectal trauma? Uh, the vast majority are penetrating, gunshot wounds, uh, both in the military and in civilian, about 80%. Blunt trauma can occur and cause uh, rectal trauma. And when it does, it's a big injury. That's about a 50% mortality. You start looking at some of those other sentinel injuries that we have, such as scapular fractures and first rib fractures and things that say, ooh, we better worry this patient may die. You get a blunt trauma and a rectal injury, you've got problems on your hand. A lot of that's related to pelvic fractures, blast injuries, think uh, ground level explosive devices like mines, IEDs, and things like that. And then rectal manip manipulation, unfortunately things like assault, people get bludgeoned and, and injured. Uh, some people self-afflicted. I don't even want to go there. <laughs> and then atrogenic, people in this room, we're the causes of some of the trauma. But all of it's trauma and things that we have to deal with. Uh, I didn't run across any of the articles that I've read in the past with uh, pneumatic injuries. Uh, those can happen with high pressure air in, in strange ways, or even water skiing accidents when people land on their backsides. But, there are a variety of ways to get to develop rectal trauma. So most of the discussion since uh, basically World War II has been in, in reference to colon trauma. And it focuses around, do you do a primary repair of the injury? Do you resect the injury and repair it with a primary anastomosis? And a lot of those people that I show, this is where they're uh, energies were spent. But when it comes down to, to the rectum, uh, I come back here. The, what we're going to talk about today is the extra uh, peritoneal uh, rectal injuries. The intraperitoneal uh, injuries are uh, treated just like any other colon injury. Nothing special about it. You treat it in the same way. So we had this discussion a, uh, a few weeks ago in a uh, uh, surgery conference is the anatomy of the rectum and how many centimeters, what happens, and, and things like that. Okay. The correct answer is, is you divide the, the rectum into thirds. The lowest third is all extra peritoneal. Middle third has a peritoneal covering anterior, and then it's retroperitoneal on the lateral aspects. And then the upper third is all intra-abdominal. It has a mesentery, and it's intraperitoneal. You can try using numbers of, of how far to look, and whether it's in the rectum, or whether it's uh, uh, intraperitoneal, and things like that. But I've done a lot of proctoscopic exams, and I still can tell you I can fudge several centimeters one way or the other. When I look with a proctoscope, if I want it to be at six centimeters, I want it to be at 12, I can pretty much make it happen. To me, the more reliable things are the rectal valves, or the valves of Houston. And there are generally three. And when you do your scope and look, the lowest rectal valve is always extra peritoneal. The third one is always intraperitoneal. And the second valve is usually right about the uh, level of the peritoneum. And so to me, it's a good dividing point. But here's the peritoneum. And so today, we're going to focus on this. 
not not a big area that can be a, a big problem with uh, trauma. Part of the reason it's a big problem, small area, a lot of stuff. The uh, In women, perineal reflection comes across here, and you have uterus, the bladder, the vagina, all of which can be concomitantly injured, needs to be looked at and managed. In men, you have the bladder and the prostate. Again, all down here in the extra peritoneal portion of the, the rectum. And those are adjacent structures to be concerned about. There are also blood vessels. Some of them I even know the names of, uh, like the internal iliac uh, vessels and, and all these are big vessels that can be, be injured and quite devastating. But there's also a big venous plexus down in the, uh, the distal pelvis, and those get injured, and they're very, very hard to manage to control the bleeding uh, that can be associated. So you have vessels, but you also have bones. You have the pelvis, and so you can get uh, fractures, pelvic fractures, hip fractures that are concomitant injuries uh, with the rectal trauma that will need to be managed. So, how do you approach these patients? Nothing magic. Go look at them do primary secondary surveys. Uh, uh, Y'all, uh, the residents, can lecture me about doing the primary and secondary surveys. Uh, but you know, to go look and make, take care of the imminently life-threatening things first and then work on. But you want to look for the associated injuries. Very frequent associated with intra-abdominal injuries pelvic injuries and fractures. As I said, genital urinary injuries up to about 43%. Vascular injuries up to about 43%. And with these uh, uh, concerns uh, with uh, rectal trauma and associated injuries, you have somewhere in the ballpark of about 30% mortality in the first week. So uh, not to be taken lightly. How to evaluate a patient for a rectal trauma for a rectal injury. The uh, <laughs> first, we've never talked about this before, high index of suspicion. Everything that we see, the first thing that people tell you, they give you a talk, so you have to think about it and have a high index of suspicion. Nothing different for this today. You still have to have a high index of suspicion. The first thing on the evaluation, other than evaluating the first primary and secondary surveys and seeing that you, know, you might even suspect a rectal trauma is a digital rectal exam. And you go by looking. Do you see anything? Do you see a big sphincter tear or something that make you think that the rectum could be injured? And look for blood on the exam finger. That's generally not normal unless you have bad luck and a patient with a rectal cancer comes in uh, with trauma. But if you see blood, You've got a rectal injury until you've proven something otherwise, and you need to do some work. <laughs> How next to examine them? Proctoscopic exam. The uh, rigid proctoscope or flexible proctoscope. Uh, in reality today, uh, most of the residents and surgeons are not real facile with a rigid uh, proctoscope. Uh, I'm sorry, I'll try to do better at teaching, but it's just don't get the opportunity to use them, but you can always use a flexible scope to do the same thing. They're actually pretty handy and uh, get someone to bring it to you or take it to the operating room if you need it. Again, mostly you're looking for blood and trying to confirm an injury, not exclude an injury. Just because you look and you don't see an injury does not mean that a patient doesn't have an injury. You still need to keep it as a uh, high index of suspicion. If you have a penetrating injury and it looks like the course is through the rectum, you better be concerned that they have an injury uh, despite what you might see. So it's not exclusive, it's confirmatory. <clears throat> One other word about proctoscopic exams. In female patients, as I mentioned, vaginal injuries can often be associated. 
and probably a small act of Congress to try to put a lady up in stirrups down in the trauma bay to and get a speculum to do an injury. Frankly, you can do a much better vaginal exam with a flexible uh, endoscope or a rigid proctoscope than you can with a, a vaginal speculum. And so before you look in the rectum, look in the vagina, see if you see an injury. You've got the tools, you already have it there, use it, and uh, you'll find it can be very helpful. And then water-soluble contrast enemas can be used. So urethrograms look for associated uh, bladder and uh, uh, urinary tract injuries. You know, it's hard to get out of the emergency room these days without getting a CAT scan. And so a lot of these patients will be seen and evaluated with a CAT scan. If you are, giving them rectal contrast at the time of the scan uh, might demonstrate an injury to you. So, Again, these high-risk trauma patients, uh, associated injuries are frequent, uh, large morbidity, and can have a very high mortality. The, uh, so, these are numbers for rectal trauma. I suspect that just about any trauma you want to pick I mean, I know for colon trauma, but probably for vascular trauma, just about anything that you want to pick, you'll get a similar curve from World War I, Civil War days, to the current Middle Eastern uh, uh, <coughs> conflicts. But in World War I and prior, rectal trauma, intradominal trauma, colon trauma was treated with observation. Uh, they basically didn't do surgery. The patients that survived developed a uh, fistula uh, and lived. It's just out of good fortune that, that those people uh, lived. I don't know how many of y'all have ever read the uh, book Lonesome Dove, but Lippy, uh, who was kind of a half-wit, uh, had had uh, a, an abdominal trauma, and he had uh, probably a colon fistula that he survived with. So. That's how people survived. But in World War I, people started doing some uh, direct repairs of rectal injuries. And so that was one of the first approaches beyond just observation. Get into World War II, this is before Dr. DeBake. Dr. DeBake wrote about the results coming out of uh, World War II. But again, you had a lot of different surgeons <laughs> No consistency, so the uh, Surgeon General issued a, a memorandum or directive and said, this is how we're going to take care of these injuries. There, this involved multiple different types of injuries, uh, this whole uh, uh, circular. But paragraphs 4E and 4F dictated that patients were to have a proximal colostomy for any of their injuries. So colostomies became mandatory. And penetrating rectal uh, trauma should have laparotomy. They would get a proximal colostomy, but they should also have presacral drainage. And so coming out of World War II, the victims of colostomy and presacral drainage uh, were developed. And so then in the... Uh, Vietnam War era, one of the, the big studies that ultimately came out, but the directives were distal washout. So Levinson in 71 uh, purported uh, distal washout. And this became the standard of care coming out of the Vietnam uh, era and going into you know, further conflicts and going into civilian practice. This appeared to work. So you had direct repair in World War I, diversion and presacral drainage in World War II, and then distal washout in Vietnam. So again, you would presume that we're all through. It could be, maybe. But this curve goes down, and the question is, 
not only was it the colostomies that make this go down, or antibiotics, volume support, transportation, all of these things changed and improved. And that's why all the curves look like this. Our care around the patient, supporting the patient, got better. But also figured out how to take care of some of the specific injuries that, that people had. So today, if you're going to have anything, you've got to have a, some type of table to go with it or a grading scale. And this is one from the American Association for Trauma, uh, for, uh, for the surgery of trauma. And this is a rectal injury uh, site scale. And y'all can kind of look down through there and all that. I found this in a doctor book and copied it out. And I didn't find a reference to it in a single article. So somebody made up a scale, and I'm sure I didn't read every word ever written, so you can probably find it. But here's what most people were doing, is non-destructive rectal injuries, injuries that involve less than 25% of the total circumference of the rectum. So it seems to be a cutoff <coughs> in the management, whether it's destructive, like blow the whole rectum up, or if you've got a tear, cut, hole, something like that in the rectum. So the non-destructive rectal injuries become the more pertinent uh, injuries. The, uh, the other thing that comes into the care and consideration, and this comes into the care and consideration of other wounds, blast injuries, high velocity injuries, cause a lot of surrounding uh, damage, and so that can uh, uh, be uh, considered as you're taking care of the patient. So, keep coming back to the same thing, the three Ds, diversion, drainage, just a washout, sometimes a direct repair. And this is just kind of progressed through the, the history of doing things. So, let's talk about them because as Dr. Weigel said, you got a rectal injury, do a colostomy, Go home, everybody's happy. And that's, to a degree, pretty true. So, <coughs> colostomies. <coughs> Generally, loop colostomies. Now, when I was a resident, there was a lot of argument about loop versus uh, divided colostomies, <coughs> completely diverting, and things like that. But most of the time, a loop is satisfactory if it's well formed. And you're not trying to prevent every single drop of stool necessarily going down, but you don't want to have a continuous fecal stream going to your injury or repair or something downstream. So you can make stomas in the sigmoid, descending, transverse, ascending. Sigmoid is preferable by a long shot because you have less of a column of stool between the diversion and the injury. Going to the trouble to mobilize a descending colon to make a loop colostomy is a big operation. Probably don't want to be doing that and being there. Transverse colostomies are okay, but they're big, they're smelly, they can be hard to pouch. Please don't do ascending colon colostomies. They're just terrible. They're the worst. They really smell. They're really hard to pouch. And you could do a diverting ileostomy just about eight inches away and have a much better stoma. But again, you want to cut down on this column of stool between you and the, uh, uh, and the injury down there. But I'm getting old, and as you get old, you start thinking about history and things like that. You think, everybody in this class thinks, ooh, just do a colostomy. That's all you gotta do, and you'll take care of the patient, and everything's good. I want to put that in a little bit of perspective. In the 1960s, the American Association of Ostomy Patients was uh, founded. In the 1950s, there were almost no manufacturers of ostomy supplies. They didn't have anything. World War II, when they first talked about uh, on a large scale doing colostomies for diversion, there were no ostomy supplies. There was not a country in the world that made ostomy supplies. So you're really 
taking a patient and putting them in a bad position, when you give them a colostomy, they've become a social outcast. There are others in this room that may remember. I have had seen patients, my own eyes, with uh, uh, bread bags taped to their abdominal wall with scotch tape. That was their supplies. In the, the U.S., when you really get down to it, uh, Dr. Turnbull and, and his people at the Cleveland Clinic really got into ostomy management in the 70s. Now, that's not very long ago, but before <laughs> that, people had almost no support for their colostomy. So that was a really a big, bold move. Not only did they not have supplies, but you didn't mature this colostomy in the operating room when you did it. You brought the loop up and waited three to five days later and either brought them back to the operating room or took cautery to the bedside and opened the anti-mesenteric side to mature the colostomy. So what we think of today is nice, mature, good-looking colostomy with the ostomy appliance uh, put on, patients ready to go and to get well. It's a far cry from the bold move that these surgeons were making during World War II and the, the Vietnam era. Uh, so I think it's kind of impressive. And so we have to remember the history and where we uh, came from with this information. So diversion. Where do we stand with diversion today? Since that's the main one, I'll talk about it first. The Eastern Association for the Surgery of Trauma this year uh, developed some uh, guidelines. They did a big meta-analysis, and, and they come up several times. There's one real problem, and you can do meta-analysis on this, but there are almost no good papers on rectal trauma and what to do as far as having well-designed uh, uh, controlled trials of how to manage these people. You, you're trying to take a lot of uh, random, almost random information and mold it into something. But they found evidence to support that if you have a non-destructive rectal injury, that's appropriate to do a colostomy. So Dr. Weigel's right. You can do a colostomy, and that's all okay. I'm still in 2011 except for minor injuries, also recommended proximal diversion. And then in wartime injuries, Dr. Duncan did a, a look at the uh, Middle Eastern conflict injuries <coughs> and recommended diversion. But then there are also some small reports that say that you can do a direct repair with no proximal diversion. If you can get to the injury easily, do a direct repair. The other one, Dr. Gonzalez in South Alabama, they had 14 patients. They did no diversion, no drainage. They gave them antibiotics and then did a water contrast enema about five days later, uh, documenting their injuries, and they, they did very well. So the current status of things is most of the supports for diverting these patients, but there's also some developing support for doing nothing. And I'm going to still talk about that a tad bit more. But we can go through and look at each of these, uh, these options. Presacral drainage. This was uh, proposed in World War II. And it involves coming at the tip of the coccyx and getting into the retrorectal space and, and putting drain in there. The idea is let any bad humors, let any infection, let stool or anything drain in a controlled manner here. Down here, this is the anal sphincter, and it has a connection to the tip of the coccyx. Then you have the pelvic floor muscular tour here, and this is your space here. One of the reasons that people even question doing presacral drainage if you're not doing abdominal perineal resections on a pretty regular basis or operating down here, this isn't always so easy because one tendency is to pop through this pretty formidable support for the sphincter 
think you're into the pre-sequel space and you start developing this plane up through here, and that's where all that venous plexus is, and now you're faced with a whole bunch of blood, so you have a patient with a rectal injury and a bleeding problem in the pelvis. You've created a problem. Or if you're bright enough to get through here and you have your bobe turned up to flamethrower level <laughs> and you burn a hole into the rectum, now the patient has an additional rectal injury. So it's, it sounds good. You know, send the intern back there the second year and just make, make a cut at the hind anus at the tip of the coccyx and put a drain in. Well, it's not always just super easy to do. So, today, the support for doing pre sacral drainage from 1989 predominantly uh, Felicio and Maddox, and they had 100 injuries, and they had a very significant uh, reduction in infectious morbidity. And they said it was the thing to do. More current studies, the Eastern Trauma Group says, no, it's not necessary. Gonzalez, in a different uh, paper, they did a randomized uh, study of uh, drainage and found that it did not improve anything. Most of the reviews say no pre drainage today for non-destructive injuries. The, uh, so what about distal rectal washout? Vietnam era uh, recommendation. The idea here, not too hard, basically give the patient an enema. You either use irrigation through the anus to wash out the stool or if you do a divided colostomy or loop colostomy, use the distal limb and do an anti-grade irrigation of the rectum to remove the stool. Newer idea is just to digitally remove the gross stool and not irrigate. So where do we stand in 2016? That's, I guess, where we are today. Actually, since Dr. Levinson's uh, review in 1971, he hadn't gotten much love for distal rectal washout. Most of the studies have not supported it. Again, the Eastern Group and the uh, multiple combined studies have shown no improvement over morbidity and mortality. So generally, distal rectal washout is not highly advocated uh, these days for uh, civilian non-destructive uh, trauma. I can't do that left hand. So, direct repair. All the way back to uh, World War I. The, uh, most of the studies have been uh, very selective studies on direct repair. And they tend to focus on the distal rectum things that you can reach per anus to uh, repair. <coughs> Maxwell and Fabian supported in 2003. Uh, Dr. Steele, in a large review, brings it into question as to whether to uh, do a direct repair. And basically, the bottom line is, if you can reach it and do it easily, it's fair to repair it. Then you can make your own judgment as to do you want to do proximal diversion. But the, it is very much and consistently advocated that if you can do a lot of dissection, go in and take down all those presacral planes in order to find a distal, repair, uh, distal injury to repair, you're probably not doing the patient a benefit. That if it requires a lot of dissection from above, avoid it. But I do a pretty good many transanal endoscopic microsurgery procedures now. Now, I tend to close my, my injuries, and I say 10, not 100%. There are some institutions that will take out large hunks of rectum and leave the wound open and do nothing. They will give the patient antibiotics. They may give them clear liquids for a few days, but this raises a whole bunch of questions. Uh, Maybe some of these injuries just don't need anything done. So as I said, 
I'm going to take something that's pretty simple and make it confusing. That's kind of the opposite of what I'm supposed to do, but that's where we live. In today, you have the three Ds, the fourth D, and maybe we have a fifth D now. Uh, diversion is generally supported. You're not going to get in trouble when seeing a patient with rectal trauma and doing a colostomy. You generally not get in trouble with any of these, but you can probably not win a lot of love for presacral drainage and even less for distal rectal washout. This is very selective and depends on your comfort level. I'm going to say for uh, many surgeons, this is not going to be the place that they're going to feel more comfortable. They're going to be more comfortable doing a vascular injury in the abdomen or doing a colon resection than they are trying to get the patient up into uh, stirrups and visualize a rectal injury. This is not going to happen a whole lot. But here's one to, to think about, the patient that has a uh, uh, low velocity or uh, penetrating injury of the, the rectum is maybe they just need observation and don't need surgery at all. And uh, consider that as an option. All right, destructive injuries, the wartime thing. These are different injuries. These, these are hopefully not what's being seen on King's Highway too terribly much uh, as far as bombs and, and all the high velocity injuries can certainly be considered. But since we don't see a lot, I'm gonna keep it kind of simple. <coughs> Diversions, yes. If they've had a whole bunch of rectum destroyed, yes. Velocity. Presacral drainage, probably. The wartime surgeons seem to still support that. Just to wash out, think about it, but that's about it. Probably not going to irrigate them. In a destructive injury, thyroid repair is not, is not applicable. But let's get realistic about these destructive injuries. Many times, these are not going to be just a proximal diversion. In order to gain control of the situation, the injury is going to have to be resected, as in a low Hartman's procedure, and that patient's going to end up with a colostomy. You need to take out the devitalized tissue, and those presacral drains that I, veins that I mentioned earlier, uh, patients with massive bleeding and a massive injury, at some point may require traumatic abdominal perineal resection and packing just to control the bleeding. Rare things, things to be considered more in a military setting. So, being the big time rectal trauma surgeon that I am, not, the type of things that I see for, for rectal trauma is during a holiday, 61 year old female comes in, that day she had new onset of rectal pain some tenesmus, she tried an enema, then she came to the emergency room, she was tender and had posterior ecchymosis when I looked, and she was very tender on exam but had no gross bleeding. She was a very healthy patient with a chronic pulmonary condition, coronary artery disease, hypertension, prior stroke, on chronic steroids of a pretty high dose, and she was cuminonized. Just a nice healthy little lady that anesthesia saw her and she was an ASA of four. And actually operating on her, she'd be a 4E. So now what do we do? We have diversion and we have presacral drainage. We have distal washouts. We have direct repairs. And to help a little bit more, how do we hit this one? <coughs> We got a CAT scan. Here's the rectum, and this is air. And I think most of the students recognize that air outside the bowel is generally not a good finding. So, my sick little lady has air outside the rectum and ecchymosis, and I have to figure out what to do. And I knew about the three Ds and repair. So, I take her to the operating room, 
I looked with a proctoscope, didn't see anything, but that doesn't exclude anything. She had an abrasive wound in the posterior distal rectum, probably poked an enema tip through there. I did presacral drainage alone. I did not divert her, and I didn't do a distal washout. She was a terrible candidate for a colostomy. She did not have a bunch of stool in the vault. And she had the air on my CAT scan, if you followed it, she had air starting to track superior, looking like it was headed toward the retroperitoneum. And I really didn't want this sick little lady to have a retroperitoneal abscess up in the mid-abdomen. And so I just put her up. I felt very comfortable getting into the presacral space, put a large catheter in, drained it, and she did extremely well. So I got lucky. So this starts to fall into, you have a choice of almost anything you want. You have to pick it to the patient. So diversion, drainage, just a washout, direct repair, do nothing. As always, it's just kind of like that, having a high index of suspicion. Instead of just rolling in saying, this is what we do on every patient that has a rectal injury, look and see what fits that patient. So I went through a whole rectal trauma uh, 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 talk, figuring that, that I have some gory extra, uh, pictures. I didn't own any, but Dr. Moran in, in orthopedics saved me this morning because he had one and, and sent it to me. So out of the, the papers, Cleary and Steele has excellent reviews. Dave Welling was a friend of mine from the Air Force. He's at the Uniformed Services uh, facility in Bethesda. And he and Dr. Duncan have been writing about the Middle Eastern trauma. And, uh, and that, if you ever want to go back and look at, Dave talks about a lot of the history in a very nice way of discussing this. And uh, he has an emphasis on uh, patients that his talks about colon, colon and rectal trauma, but he makes a very good point that we need to reconsider the direct uh, repairs without ostomies in these patients that are getting operated on, going to another in theater facility, then going to Europe and then going to the U.S. all in a matter of four or five days or a week. That what they're finding is patients that have leaks or missed along the way, and they're having about a 30% mortality rate from leaks. And so, just a different view on this. Any questions? Like Nastomotic leaks. Well, you're putting patients in, people aren't monitoring them. They're getting put at altitude, which raises some questions on, on their status. Uh, he and Dr. Duncan are, are Posing to rethink. They, they did a lot of their things off there, a lot of emails going back and forth between young surgeons from trauma groups to Vietnam era older surgeons and what is the right way. But anyway, it's, it's good reading. Yes? What antibiotic um, protocol do you use when, let's say, you do a presacral drainage or let's say it's a minor injury and you're just going to watch it? Which antibiotics do you like to use? Flagyl. Uh, usually, initial dose of Flagyl and, and Cipro or something like that. Uh, on my TEM patients, uh, they'll get uh, Cipro and Flagyl or Invans uh, uh, operatively, uh, perioperatively. But leaving that large posterior open wound, I personally, and I have nothing to support me. So you can just shoot me down if you want to. But I put them on flagell for about a week uh, and clear liquids. And there's nothing out there supporting. In general, the topic of uh, 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 prophylactic antibiotics uh, for the rectal trauma, colon trauma is still the same, uh, 24 hours uh, in general. But I think if you're leaving an open wound uh, without other coverage, somebody, I guess, has to come prove to me that it's bad and dangerous. <laughs> Other questions? Confuse everybody well enough? 